Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me. So this is work uh, done together with Octave Loros, uh, Sophie Kaliba, and in collaboration with Shopify's uh, Chris Seaton. Uh, before I get started, just a little bit of an ad. Uh, we do actually have two postdoc positions. One is on work on the Sherry architecture and one more in the direction of concurrency and performance and especially trying to avoid concurrency issues to cause harm. So if you're interested, please reach out. But I want to talk about interpreter performance and we have been talking about the native image compilation. So I'm basically interested in taking Truffle interpreters, compiling them ahead of time and seeing what kind of performance we get out of that, disabling all the fancy features um, Graal gives us for runtime um, yeah, uh, compilation. So as a language implementer, we might be interested how do things work. So here, just a little bit of an introduction. Um, imagine we have here the Mandelbrot example. The basic bit I'm interested here is there is essentially a computation where we square a double value assigned to a local variable. So if you look at that from a language imp implementer's perspective, um, you may go about that implementing that as an AST and uh, in the Truffle world, uh, these kind of nodes would represent your execution. You have an execution method on them. You could also go about implement it as bytecode interpreters nowadays in Truffle. So the interesting part that Truffle gives you here, Truffle on the side, um, is kind of the ability to teach these nodes to specialize themselves to specific ways of being used, especially when we implement dynamic languages. One thing we kind of need to get performance with a just-in-time compiler, um, we need to know exactly what type of values perhaps or what kind of specific things we saw at runtime to make things fast. So in our case, we may want to know that things were actually double values. So how does it work? Um, if you implement, for instance, here the read local node, uh, you would add a little bit of specialization to read from Truffle's frame where you represent local variables, um, that value as a double. And then the multiplication can know that it's a double and can um, activate the right part of the implementation to compute double multiplication. Now, when we execute that at runtime, um, where is my slide stuck? Now, um, so we execute our program and our nodes at runtime will essentially specialize here in that specific little program. It's mostly the types that are interesting. So we specialize on writing full values to local variables, multiply doubles and treating doubles from local variables. And then our Graal compiler comes in for just-in-time compilation and the expectation is that we get ideally something like that. So just moving a bit of values around and multiplying them with the um, whatever instruction set you have here, in that case, uh, some AMD64 uh, multiplication and structure. And ideally, that's the best case scenario and you get great performance. Now, the first questions we had is, does that promise hold? So before we can assess that, let's talk a little bit about benchmarks. The benchmarks that I used are uh, they called RP Fastjet benchmarks. It's a collection of kind of older benchmarks that I put together. It's kind of nine micro benchmarks and five small, but not quite so micro, um, maybe about a thousand lines of code each. Um, by now we have at least nine languages. Some others like Scala have been implemented by other people. Um, but uh, yeah, so it has been used quite a bit to compare the performance and the runtime optimization from different languages. And what I want to highlight here is when we compare, for instance, to Node.js at the top, and I don't know what my computer is doing, it's very slow. Um, so then we normalize our benchmark measures to Node.js performance, JavaScript, um, and compare that to our Truffle languages. We see that Truffle Ruby, Graal.js, and Graal Python are in a pretty good range. So on average, they're pretty close to our Node.js performance. And um, if you know a little bit more about uh, advanced uh, systems, so we here actually have kind of a range of plus 2x, minus 2x, which is somewhat common um, if different uh, systems make different optimization choices. So great. The first insight is, yes, our Truffle-based languages are actually competitive with the state of the art at least on these benchmarks. 
when we rely on graph for just in time compiling. But so why wouldn't we use just in, just in time compilation? Well, so just in time compilers need time to warm up. And it turns out that the modern code bases, at least for certain type of applications, are pretty huge. So here are a couple of examples, taking Facebook, they have 100 million lines of code, probably more nowadays, um, pretty old numbers here. They deployed, I think that's three, four, five years ago, um, every 75 minutes. Shopify, again, um, also relatively old numbers, I believe. Uh, so about 3 million lines of Ruby code, and they deployed uh, yeah, almost every half an hour. And I think they hired last year something like 1,000 engineers. So I assume those numbers would just reduce and more deploys, more code. Um, Instagram, same story, million lines of code of Python here and 30 to 45 times um, a day deployment. So yeah, what does it mean in practice? Um, here relying also on the plot from um, Facebook paper. So they report that they basically lose much of their capacity for the 21st 25 minutes of warm-up they perceive. So you rem remember, they have a huge amount of code and a just-in-time compiler re needs time to compile all that code. So what they observe is that for the first five minutes, they basically run very close to zero capacity. And then it slowly ramps up and after 25 minutes, they reach 100% capacity. So our goal is kind of to move that lower bar we want to make interpreters and especially um, truffle interpreters faster so that we kind of remove a little bit of that uh, step of that cost of uh, having a delayed uh, warm-up with just-in-time compilation. So the first thing, let's look at how does performance look like if we actually disable graph compilation. So same interpreter, we just tell it not to compile anything. So when I look at Node.js um, here as a baseline, again, compare that to Graal.js, that's the um, enterprise edition. We see almost an order of magnitude um, the interpreter being slower than the JIT-less version of Node.js. Um, and the same is true for Truffle Ruby here. So again, about an order of magnitude slower, and Python doesn't look very different. Uh, again, about an order of magnitude slower. Now, um, I wanted to experiment how can we make those interpreters faster. Um, these languages are really, really complicated and uh, taking two weeks to implement an experiment, uh, yeah, especially when it fails, is uh, not a very good use of time. So I typically experiment with um, some a simple language. Um, if I'm not experimenting with Truffle Ruby, here's the idea, it's, it's a minimal object-oriented language, a bit of class inheritance, everything is dynamic dispatch, you have uh, something like exceptions, but it's a very small language, small enough to be easily understood by students, but big enough to be useful. And in terms of usefulness, well, we can implement all our benchmarks. So here, just a little bit of a peek. Um, so truffle some, uh, that mouse doesn't work, um, truffle some in the middle of the chart, um, we, we are basically in the same performance zone on peak performance as the other implementations. For practical reasons, I actually run on community edition here. Um, but when we look at interpreter performance, my interpreter actually outperforms um, these truffle interpreters. So here for comparison, um, we are only about uh, 3x lower than Node.js JITless. So I'm just saying that to give you an impression that SOM is actually a relatively useful tool for these kind of experiments. Okay, so why are our interpreters now so slow? So let's have a quick look at where Truffle interpreters actually spend their time um, in the context of Truffle SOM and in this case also the community edition. Um, that's mostly for practical reasons no conceptual reasons, should also work with the enterprise edition. The first thing um, I should say is the profile data that I took here is native image profiling of the interpreter, aggregating over um, relative numbers for each benchmark. So um, yeah, there is no specific weighting here. What we see is a lot of time is actually spent in the garbage collection routines here. And yes, we know um, community editions garbage collection isn't uh, particularly optimized or not as optimized as others. So no surprise here. 
What we then see is the first thing at the top is a frame without boxing constructor. So creating truffle frames um, is relatively complicated. And then you see a lot of profiling going on in um, these kind of optimized call target routines. So that's basically a user level method that you call. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on, which is relatively expensive. I tried optimizing that and cutting that out. Um, of course, the just-in-time compiler wasn't amused about that, uh, losing all the profiling information. But uh, even more depressing, perhaps, the interpreter didn't show a lot of improvement either. But I think that's something to watch out for when we get our interpreters faster. Now, the other things we see is here, um, we essentially have very high in the profile, simply a method to evaluate arguments for a method call. And then we see kind of things like iterating over the um, elements in a sequence in a method and uh, generally kind of uh, applying method calls. So very generic things. We also at the relatively high C kind of our method lookup implementation. Um, and then the rest is kind of local arguments and accessing here may be interesting, accessing the frame object. So again, Truffle tries to be a safe language implementation environment and that comes with a little bit of cost. Uh, but what we mostly see is here on the right hand side, there is a long tail of things that all take time. So what that tells me is we basically um, spend a lot of time everywhere. So everything is just a little bit slow. Um, there is not a single thing that we can really optimize and get immediate benefit we tried. Um, but yeah, so what could we do instead? Well, let's do some experiments. So the first thing um, that we did, we kind of built a tool to identify patterns that are commonly used. And um, so here are two examples um, that are really popping up in specific benchmarks, um, dynamically often used. So one is my previous example, kind of multiplying a value, taking the square or computing the square. Um, and then on the right hand side, we see kind of simply incrementing a counter. And when we look into those a little bit further, we actually see uh, specific usage patterns. So here we build kind of what I call super nodes, uh, similar to super instructions. So combination of nodes that do very specific things. So one optimization we can do is combining the read with a multiplication to only have to do the read once and all the guards and checks, like type checks uh, in the read nodes. Um, another thing we can then do is if we actually assign it to the same variable again, then we can combine reading and writing and uh, multiply and thereby, again, avoid a lot of redundant checks at runtime. Same idea for our uh, addition node. Um, so we could create a node that uh, simply adds always a known constant instead of having that extra constant node. Or we can create a node that combines all the things if we read and write the same local variable. Or perhaps, and that's where super nodes go kind of beyond um, uh, super instructions, we can kind of uh, leave basically a hole in our ST node and uh, evaluate any arbitrary expression. Like in my example, it's just a constant, but uh, in other uh, programs that's useful. So, but what that means is we kind of come up with a lot of uh, similar patterns, uh, but we need different nodes to implement them in our interpreter. We looked specifically at four different uh, patterns. So uh, one of them is method sense or method applications typically use this argument. So that can be optimized. We saw our increment decrement operator, the square operator. And then in a parser benchmark, um, a lot of things are compared to constant strings. And uh, that kind of comparison is relatively complicated. So we thought about optimizing that. So it's relatively focused experiments, but uh, it takes us 18 nodes to implement. So here, just a couple of numbers on the results. So we reduce the um, uh, execution time, for instance, in our JSON parser by 13, 14%. But things like uh, micro benchmarks, like the field loop um, here, they reduced by about a half. So quite a nice speed up, uh, but not very generalizable. You saw there were just kind of four different types of patterns.
So if you look at it from the big picture on our RV fast yet benchmarks that we used for comparison, okay, we got a little bit of a gain, um, but overall it's kind of disappointing. We are not getting that uh, one order of magnitude speed up we would need for things like uh, Truffle Ruby, for instance. So overall impact, very limited. And the other problem we had is, of course, we needed to implement any different classes for that. So we have a kind of a node explosion and code explosion, and all that is not maintainable. So trying to convince, for instance, the Truffle Ruby people to kind of add 18 extra classes for just that, um, I don't think uh, we would succeed there. And I don't think we would want to. So what could we do instead? How could we deal with that kind of code explosion problem? Well, people say bytecode interpreters should be really fast. Um, one benefit is, of course, bytecodes are much more compact than objects. Um, we avoid GC overhead, and perhaps even the dispatch might be faster. So let's have a quick look at that. I implemented bytecode versions for my um, AST interpreters, and down here, um, I'm not very good at bytecode interpreters, as it turns out. So the problem here is that my bytecode interpreter is actually slower than the AST interpreter. Even so, it actually reuses some of the same logic and some of the same optimization. Um, just for reference, I also implemented the same thing, not just on Truffle, but also on R Python, which is a, um, another meta compilation tool chain, but uh, doesn't have the kind of same constraints as uh, Java. So we thought, ah, maybe uh, there it looks better, um, but basically the same picture. All right. So, um, but there is one benchmark that actually stuck out as giving us benefit, and that was loading all our some code, um, which is about 15,000 lines of code, and simply kind of benchmarking what does a garbage collector uh, spend in terms of time on garbage collecting essentially our ASTs or bytecodes. So here the benefit is quite huge going to bytecodes. And uh, especially on the community edition, we see at least uh, minus 60% on that specific benchmark, which really just exercises a garbage collector. Um, I don't know exactly why G1 is not as impressed uh, by the bytecodes, but yeah. So there is quite a bit of a gain to be had switching to bytecodes. Now, my full bytecode interpreters didn't work out all that well, so I thought, okay, well, let's pick out specific use cases. So I looked at a couple of benchmarks, a couple of trivia methods. Um, like in the list benchmark, there's a small method with a trivia loop, uh, which uh, is very important for that benchmark. And the collision detector benchmark, uh, similarly, uh, some comparing number methods. And um, the random next method uh, that you hear see on the slide is used in other benchmarks. Um, so I thought optimize those. Uh, what I will focus on is here just the initializer methods. So initializers or constructors are fairly common in many object-oriented languages. Turns out, if you choose an interesting subset, they actually just fancy setters. So I thought, oh, okay, let's select those. Let's uh, come up with a minimal bytecode set, which really just covers all those use cases. And that you see here on the, on the slide. So it's basically just storing into a field. Typically, you're reading the arguments of your constructor method or uh, writing things like 0, 1, true, false into a field. So that's it. Now, the, the other three options um, and that specific initializer method uh, applied, we see, oh, yeah, it actually gives a little bit of a speed up. So for our list benchmark, reduction by about a third, kind of nice. But uh, the other is not super impressed. So especially the initializers, they only reduced going from a classic AST, not further optimized, to a bytecode loop, only gave us 11%. So that, that's not kind of the, um, yeah, the order of magnitude we are looking for, unfortunately. But we get a little bit of extra information from that. Um, because we now know that initializers are just glorified setters, one thing we can do is also avoid the method call overhead uh, in Truffle. And that gives us a third of a speed up from, from the baseline. So that, that's kind of neat. Uh, but that again shows us here, call overhead is quite, quite uh, high. So yeah, we need to see what we can do about that. Now, the next question for us was, okay, what would be kind of the best case that we could get? Think like a baseline compiler. 
Um, so that's a manual experiment that I did. The idea here being kind of taking our truffle nodes, we know they basically all have these execute methods and there's a kind of a dispatch overhead. So what would we get if we build a node specific to a method um, that basically aligns um, most of these things? So we, we do a little bit of um, optimizations in terms of we assume that uh, certain types are known, we assume that primitive operations can be inlined into our Uber node, if you will. And we assume that we can also uh, avoid accessing actually truffle frame except uh, around loop boundaries. Um, so to, to kind of get an impression of what would an interpreter where we have zero dispatch overhead in the interpreter, be it bytecodes or um, AST nodes, give us in terms of performance. The one thing we didn't do is um, figure out how to really optimize things like field and array accesses, because there's a lot of dynamicity in these languages still. So we simply reuse the nodes that we have there. So it's not the perfect best case. Um, so it's a little bit too pessimistic on those access nodes, um, but it's relatively optimistic on the other bits. So yeah, what we get here, if we apply that to all the listed benchmarks here, take basically the top one, two, three, four methods from these uh, benchmarks, turn them into these kind of Uber nodes. Well, the result is kind of mixed. So especially our micro benchmarks, yeah, great results. But uh, when it comes to the bigger benchmarks, not so much. Um, so no, anybody just 6%, uh, Delta Blue just 16%. So one, one problem here is really the method level optimizations um, don't seem to pay off all that much. Um, and again, we, we still have uh, limitations here. But uh, if we kind of uh, look at that on the RV fastest benchmarks, we see there is definite movement here. So on average, we reduce the overhead over Node.js from a 3x to a 2x, which is kind of the the direction we want to go. So, so there is uh, hopefully some potential to be had with things like super nodes and kind of mini bytecode sets. Um, but yeah, more work needed. And uh, yeah, that brings me to the end of my talk. So why do we care about interpreter speed? Well, there are applications with a huge amount of code and we want them to be immediately fast, not just after just in time calculation, which can take ages, uh, even if you have a baseline compiler. Um, we have an order of magnitude currently difference from where we want to be. So there's a lot of work to be done, but there's some hope and maybe super nodes, maybe kind of mini bytecode interpreters for specific use cases will allow us to get to the performance that we are looking for. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, there is one question from Lars uh, in the chat. I don't know if... Uh... Yeah, I can see it. Uh, so given the super instructions show speed up for the pure interpreter performance, did you also combine the super instructions with Graal enabled and would that benefit the overall JIT compilation? Uh, that means uh, time to reach 100% capacity in your introductory example. Um, yes, so we also run the benchmarks always uh, with, with Graal. I didn't put them on the slide. Um, Sometimes there is a little bit of a benefit. We did not pers we, we don't really, I don't have a good way of measuring whether there is uh, any benefits in times of compilation time. So I don't instrument that, I don't record that. Um, but from what I see, anything, any kind of benefit is at most limited. So peak performance is typically not impacted by anything that we do. Um, because Graal is good enough to, to compile and inline already on kind of the method level and uh, the extra bits of information that you get from um, the super nodes uh, doesn't, doesn't really make much of a difference. I guess conceptually we would hope that compilation time goes down, but uh, I haven't seen any indications without explicitly measuring that. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you, Stefan, for trying to make the truffle interpreter faster. That makes me very happy. Uh, <laughs> I agree with everything you said in terms of motivation. Um, well, I have one question for this. Um, a best case solutions you did. Um, that's very interesting because like having a target that we can currently reach with without changing the compiler significantly is very good. Uh, did you verify that the inline decisions on those methods are actually proper? Because one kind of rather low hanging fruit uh, we recently found is that the inlining really doesn't do a good job, especially on SVM community edition. And that a lot of the, uh, you can actually get like 20, 25% speed up only just by fixing the inlining decisions. Um, so so what, what's your thought there? So, yes, I think we, we had uh, in other places discussions about inlining not being good around, for instance, frame access and all that. Um, I have not specifically looked at um, enough graphs to to say anything more useful here. So the only thing that I definitely notice is uh, whenever I manually inline things, there is typically a speed up, which um, compiler people tell me that shouldn't be the case. but at, that's that's what I perceive. So yeah, that's I think that's what is... I see entirely as well, and that's what we've seen yeah. in our benchmarks as well. And uh, I'm actually working on a solution there. So uh, like a yeah. few weeks, then I hopefully can publish it. <laughs> but but there, it's a growl workshop here, right? So I'm complaining to compiler people. So make our inliner better for truffle interpreters, please. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's what I'm working on. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. I had uh, maybe two questions. Um, my first one was, uh, so you showed off that you basically implemented a bytecode interpreter to replace the uh, basically like tree walk truffle one. Um, I was curious, like, is that specifically like a stack oriented bytecode interpreter? Uh, and did you consider any other memory models for that? Um, yeah, so I went with a with a relatively basic stack-based interpreter close to what you would find in um i think i think ruby is a stack-based one um it's it's very similar to classic relatively highly optimized small talk interpreters um i haven't experimented with other things like register-based uh, interpreters um, I also haven't really investigated why the damn thing is slower than it literature tells us. Um, so there is a little bit of literature that tells us that Java is really a safe language and is really not the, the right medium for bytecode interpreters um, when it comes to bounce checks and stuff like that. Because well, if you implement a Turing complete language, what's the bounce checker going to be doing, right? Um, but I have not verified that. So. One of the things I'm curious about doing is basically make Java unsafe in an extra compiler to pass. Here, that's my bytecode loop. Uh, just ignore all the bounce checks and whatnot. Uh, makes it unsafe, please. Um, but uh, yeah, so beyond that, no, I haven't yet experimented with, with further ideas there. Yeah, very cool. I, I am also a little surprised that just on dispatch alone that the bytecode is not faster. But uh, wow, so it definitely makes sense this, that it this, could be chalked up these, to the language. For my mini bytecode interpreters, we, we do get a benefit, right? So it's not as yeah. big as what you would hope for. Um, exactly. But, but it's still pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I had sort of a part two real quick. Um, I'll try to wrap up shortly. Uh, I was just going to ask more broadly, um, if you were to sort of analyze, like, uh, the main goal of this is to you know, start up quickly. Uh, do you think there's some role for maybe introducing more tiered compilation to Grawl? Uh, you know, I'm not sure how much you've looked into this, but just sort of in a broad sense, like I know that's how like Hotspot traditionally approaches the issue. Uh, we saw a talk about increasing compile times this morning um, from Carlo. Uh, do you think there's some like position for that that would be uh, valuable? So I think Truffle introduced one or two releases ago a tiered compilation model. So we already have one. Um, I think the basic difference is that you don't do any user code level inlining. Um, so your specific truffle language doesn't do any inlining in the first tier. Um, and that, I think, helps for a certain set of application to get faster fast. The problem really is that we, we are an 
order of magnitude off where we need to be. And I'm not sure we can fix that with a baseline compiler, given my kind of best case scenario results not being as good as one would hope for, right? Uh -huh. So it's so I think we, we need to rethink how we design our truffle interpreters before we kind of um, get where we want to be. I think that, that can be uh, tackled at the same time, right? You can make the interpreters faster. We definitely need to do that. Uh, the multi-tier compilation, the the first tier really is bound by partial evaluation time, right? The the overheads we have from a partial from our partial evaluation, we only do the first full tomorrow projection, which is obviously not as fast as it could be. And uh, so, it, it, so the first tier is basically split up into two parts. Half of it is spent in partial evaluation. The other half is spent in the economy configuration for Qual, which also got a little faster. But even if that is a little faster, the partial evaluation stays the same speed, right? So we we did a lot of work in trying to do the second full tomorrow projections to get faster to the to the um, speed up the partial evaluation and that this is really an ongoing project and we, we need to do both right we need to fix the interpreters and we need to fix yeah. the initial compilation so. yeah all right thanks everyone yeah thank you stefan